Artlist.io Yeah, look, tell me what's the vibes, what's the mood Yeah, I just hit up Mikey for the juice Yeah, ain't no captain, I'ma tell the truth I've been running for so long, it's hard to lose Yeah, yeah, be my source, uh, Christian, like Dior Yeah, I can't stop when I'm far Music licensing yeah, be imagined Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome. First of all, thank you so much for jumping in and listening to this uh, podcast, this first episode of Snake Bit. Um, every view, every download, all that stuff means the world. Um, this has been something I've been thinking about doing for a long time, and finally decided I'm going to take the jump and go ahead and do it. And uh, so I'm excited for this first episode, and thank you so much for jumping in and listening. Uh, every person we can get out there to consume paintball content it just makes the community so much better helps us build a better paintball community which is the goal of this podcast and all the other paintball podcasts out there that's always the goal is to grow paintball um, talk about current events and things like that but also to continue to build and grow this community that we all love uh, for the sport that we love so thank you so much for joining in as i said this is the first episode of snake bit uh, this will be my podcast. It's a T. Swifty production. Uh, for those of you that follow me on YouTube, uh, the YouTube channel is T. Swifty, um, and uh, that's still in very much in its beginning phase as well. So, um, trying to get these both off the ground and going to help build paintball community and bring some eyes to Colorado paintball. Um, we've got a somewhat burgeoning uh, um, scene out here in Colorado and just trying to continue to grow the tournament side of things. We have an excellent recreational side of paintball, I think, in Colorado, but trying to grow the tournament side and get that off the ground and get some of the younger, newer players going is um, is something I'm excited about and looking forward to. And this podcast and the YouTube absolutely helps that. So thank you. Um, after that, uh, let's go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Tom Simpson, uh, T. Swifty. If for those of you guys that follow me on YouTube or Instagram or anything like that, um, excuse me, I, I've been paying, playing paintball since 1998. I joined uh, the paintball community at the ripe old age of 10. Um, I found, I was at my mom's work and I found uh, this Brass Eagle VHS tape of an introduction to paintball video and popped it into the VCR, watched it, instantly fell in love, seeing these guys run around the woods with these paintball guns. You know, me being a young kid who very much enjoyed running around the woods with my friends, uh, playing things like manhunt and tag and stuff like that, uh, just, it was right up my alley. So I went to my mom, begged her, begged her, begged her. She went and got me a, uh, a Talon pump paintball gun. That was my very first paintball gun. I uh, used those little 12 gram CO2 cartridges and ran around with the woods with my friends playing paintball and I've been hooked ever since. Um, a little bit of my, uh, background my story uh, I guess is uh, so I started playing paintball in 1998 um, and went throughout most of my years all the way through high school uh, then when I got to college I actually was uh, at college at Faulkner University in Alabama on a football and baseball scholarship so playing sports in college is a whole different animal and you have no time I mean, you're, you're in the weight room at 5.30, you're eating breakfast at 8, you got classes all day long, then you've got film at 3, out on the practice field by 4, and you're there till 6, and then you go eat dinner and do a little bit of homework if you can, and you're back at it the next day. So paintball kind of went by the wayside for me for a little while. For those couple of years I was in college, I was not a good college student. Uh, I didn't take it very seriously. I was very young and very... Uh, naive um it was joy enjoying playing sports too much to focus on what i should have been which was my academics uh and i decided after two years i was gonna go ahead and uh leave um college just wasn't for me i wasn't doing well in school and if you don't do well in school you can't play so um my junior year i would have been uh really on the verge of of not being able to play if i hadn't kept my grades up so I decided to, to move out to Colorado. I had some friends out there, and uh, one of them's, uh, sorry, I got my 
animals messing with stuff over here. Um, there's my cat, in case you guys uh, wanted to see. Uh, that's Piglet. Uh, you'll probably see my dog Cass uh, as well running around um, throughout these videos, and, and you'll probably hear him in the background of the podcast from time to time. Um, but anyway, back to what I was saying. Um, I wasn't taking my college experience seriously and wasn't uh, it just wasn't for me so I decided to leave and move out to Colorado um, I started coaching football uh, which is one of my passions I love football uh, grew up playing it come from a family of coaches my oldest brother my dad his dad so on and so forth all coached football my, my older brother still does coach football um, and he's uh, he's been trying to convince me for the last 12 years to get out of the army and come uh, come coach football with him but uh you know i've been enjoying what i do too much um but we'll get to that in a second anyway um moved out of colorado started coaching football got back into the paintball scene a little bit uh and it had changed in two years it changed pretty quickly this was 2008 um when uh paintball was kind of taking a nosedive a little bit so a lot of fields were closing their doors stores you know you name it paintball industry was taking a pretty hard hit and uh, so paintball was kind of dying, which made me incredibly sad because it's a sport I just love playing and, and grew up playing. And just it meant so much to me seeing it die out a little bit was was sad. Um, and then uh, 2010, I, uh, I just decided uh, I felt like I wasn't being fulfilled in my life and decided to take uh, take a step to try and fulfill, fulfill myself. And um, that was uh, to join the Army. So I joined the Army in 2010 uh, and went through basic training and then uh, Army EOD school. Well, it's, it's multi-service, but I went through, uh, it's called NAV School EOD down there in Destin, Florida, which is uh, pretty nice. Get to spend a year uh, in Destin, but you're in school most of the day. So uh, I was in EOD school for about a year, graduated EOD school, and uh, went out to Fort Drum, New York. It was my first duty station. Uh, but I'm not going to bore you with all those kind of details. Uh, anyway, I, I've been in the Army ever since. been doing uh, EOD uh, for 12 years now, uh, going on 13. So um, yeah, I love doing it. I get to blow stuff up, and I get to do some really incredible stuff. Um, but throughout most of my Army career, really didn't play too much paintball. Played a little bit here and there. But, uh, you know, between deployments and work, and then I got married and was starting a family, uh, that took priority, obviously. So, um, uh, so yeah, I, uh, I didn't really play too much paintball, but uh, kind of all throughout my Army career, I had a buddy who I was in basic training with, uh, Wes Itell, who plays for, uh, for Veteran Militia. You can see the jersey behind me for those of you watching. Um, he plays for Veteran Militia. He plays on the D3, uh, the five-man line. I believe he plays on the X-Ball line, but I'm not 100% on that. Um, but uh, anyway, he was always sharing these videos and pictures of him out playing paintball. Uh, also, oh, sorry, shout out to Wes Itell. Uh, thank you, I owe you so much. And he also plays for Georgia Extreme, uh, which is his other team, his main team is out there in Savannah, Georgia, uh, playing ball. So um, wanted to make sure I get him his proper shout out and, and all the proper info. Um, but anyway, he was always sharing pictures and videos of, of tournaments and practice and just being out there playing paintball and it just made me miss it. So I, I hit him up one day, I uh, messaged him and was like, hey man, you know, uh, I'm looking to get back into the sport and um, you know, don't really have a team, don't really, you know, the guns have changed since I had been playing. You know, obviously if you're looking, you see on the back wall, you know, I started shooting Impulses, was, was one of my first big tournament guns. And those are, you know, huge and way outdated now. Now we've got stuff like the Force and, uh, the Luxes and the new Shockers that are all, you know, completely different than what I was used to. So um, I hit him up and, and asked him for some help, and he got me linked in with the Veteran Militia crew, which, you know, I can't thank him enough for that. That's an awesome camp to be a part of. I'm really proud to be a part of that camp and, and try and represent them the best that I can at, at my home field and at any event I go to. Um, he got me tied in, and so I started uh, – started playing again and I was out here in Colorado I got stationed out at Fort Carson in uh, 2014 excuse me I've been dealing with a little bit of a head cold so I'm trying to try not to sound too too nasally but uh, it's a work in progress um, anyway I, uh, I 
like I said, I got stationed out at, here at Carson and um, was looking for a new field. You know, all the fields that I had known in Colorado before uh, had, had pretty much shut down uh, or changed ownership or, like I said, just didn't exist anymore. And uh, I posted on one of the Colorado paintball groups and uh, Mike O'Lear, who owns Dynamic Paintball in Aurora, uh, messaged me and was like, hey man, I'm the owner of Dynamic, uh, you know, we have a new speedball field coming up. We've got some awesome rec ball stuff. We'd love to have you out to play at our field. And um, so I was like, yeah, absolutely. So I drove the hour and a half here from Colorado Springs all the way up there and went and played one Saturday and I've been playing there ever since. Uh, it is an amazing field. I mean, he's, he's always out there making improvements. He's always out there taking care of the turf, uh, cleaning off buggers adding new stuff to the rec ball field, changing up the, the format, the, the, the look, the layout of the, the rec ball field and the speed ball field. Um, Mike has done some amazing things and he's an awesome owner. He's, he's just a wonderful, wonderful person to be around. Uh, and he's, he goes out of his way to make sure every single player, every single day out there is having a great experience, that they have everything they need that they're uh they're enjoying their time out there and i really that really struck a chord with me uh and i've been playing there since it's been my home field i'm happy to drive the hour and a half that it takes for me to get to from my house up there uh on saturdays and sundays and go play ball up there because it's worth it uh, it's worth it for the the family atmosphere it's worth it for the friendships that i've made out there um, it's worth it just to go sit up there and talk with Mike for a couple hours you know he will uh he'll talk your ear off and and I love it I mean I love all the conversations that we have because he and I both come from a little bit of the older school I mean he's older school than I he started playing baseball in the 80s uh back when uh, Navarone and those guys were out there rolling around and you know uh came up through that scene and he and I both view paintball very similarly uh from that kind of old school lens um and it, I just really enjoyed talking to him and hearing his old stories and uh, sharing my stories with him too. It's it's a good time. Um, but been playing there ever since. Um, started playing the NXL again uh, last year was my first events with uh, Veteran Militia. Uh, played uh, Chicago and World Cup with them last year. Um, and uh, anyway, that's that's kind of the whole story up to up to now. I don't want to bore you guys with 40 minutes of me talking about you know where I came from and how I started playing um uh currently I'm playing for still playing for veteran militia locally I play with a team called Entourage uh we're a uh, D4 line uh D4 X ball line out of Colorado and and it's a good group we got a good mix of some older school guys some guys that experience at the national level and the the regional level as well as some guys that have never played tournament paintball before we had their first event uh, was the RMPL event one in March, which was awesome. And uh, they're they're really young, hungry guys. Love being around them. Uh, unfortunately, my season got ended uh, before it even began. Uh, the last practice before RMPL one, I was taking a knee to shoot off the box, and something popped and tore my meniscus. So I'm still waiting surgery on that, and hoping I can be back for World Cup, but my most of my season was gone and uh in the downtime kind of like it's kind of like COVID for me you know I mean I'm not playing anymore right now right now I'm just coaching refing, trying to mentor our young guys uh and I wanted to say you know hey during this time how can I better myself and how can I help better paintball um so I took up uh some coaching uh gigs I, I'm helping coach some of the local teams and and uh, my own team helping run the pits for them to create game plans, things like that. Um, and, uh, doing some refing, uh, kind of trying to take over, help Mike with the, uh, with the speedball field, you know, the, our field is very understaffed as far when it comes to refs. So, uh, I asked Mike, how can I help? How can I make, uh, make it easier on you? And, uh, told him if he wanted me to, I'll take the, take, take over refing the, uh, speedball field. And he was like, go for it, man. And, uh, um, been enjoying that. It's a lot of fun. Uh, obviously, it's not fun being a ref most of the time, but it, it is fun getting to uh, watch our young guys out here 
grow and develop in the sport and see where they are even now from a season ago is really cool and seeing where they're going uh, they're, they're, they're going to do some big things um, so that's pretty much about it about me uh, the podcast itself so I went with the name snake bit um, for those of you that it, it's a kind of an older saying or whatever um, but when you you know you're kind of jump into something you're addicted to it like you know you jump into ski you know snow sports or surfing or fishing hunting whatever it is and you just like you do it once you can't get enough you're snake bit uh, it's the same thing with paintball i think most people that you talk to when they started playing paintball they went out and played a couple of times and it was all of a sudden like this is what i want to do i mean you talk to every pro and that's pretty much the story it's like i went out and played whether it was at a birthday party or a church group thing or, or how, whoever they, however they started, uh, they got they got the bug and they just went. So I went with the term snake bit, uh, a little bit different. You know, there's not not too many paintball names you can use, and especially don't want to name it something similar to an, any other podcast. Don't want to kind of do the copycat thing. So I went with the term snake bit. Um, the goal of the, of the podcast is really I want to um, help bring some awareness to both the Colorado paintball scene and the divisional paintball scene nationally. Uh, we're going to try and have some great guests on, see you, you know who we can get. Hopefully we can get some uh, some pretty uh, big hitters in here to talk. Also, I'm going to have some local players on here and some guys from the, uh, the PTG Discord, obviously, if, uh, if you're watching. Got the Play on Player shirt uh, rocking tonight, along with my HK Bucket hat. Um, just, uh, you know, I want to get some of those guys go on get you know have some conversations about what are the things slowing paintball down how do we fix those things and what are some of the things that we're really excited about as far as the direction paintball is headed you know what are some of the things that really get us excited about the future of this game and there's a lot of things to be excited about so hopefully we can get some great guests on for everybody and uh, have some really cool conversations um Tonight, the first episode uh, is labeled practice, practice, practice. So tonight I wanted to kind of talk about, uh, hit some things that um, that I talk about with my local guys and um, give some info out to maybe younger divisional players or someone thinking about starting up a team about uh, th tips on how we should practice, right? If we're, if we're a tournament guy, how we should practice or are we just a guy that goes out there and has fun playing on Saturday and Sunday or a rec ball player this is more geared to the teams there's the, those teams that want to go out there and compete at events compete nationally uh, regionally about how we should practice as a team to get ourselves to that level where we're going out there and we're not just going out there and playing we're going out there and podium you know every event we're going to go out there and win and be a competitive team at whatever level we're at how do we get to that next level? You know, all that kind of stuff. So it all starts in practice. I mean, I think if you talk to, you hear it, you hear it listening to Marcelo and Tyler, you hear it talking to, listening to Ryan and Kyle on their podcast, any, any pro player, when you ask them, you know, how they got so good at what they're doing or how they uh, approach going out there and being the best at what they, what they do, it's all about practice. It's all about those reps you put in when nobody's watching and you know when you're on your own and you're just got free time on the field how do we approach that time how do we make the most of it to make ourselves a better paintball player make our make us a better paintball team and go out there and start winning events so uh first first kind of topic is is overall practice right so how often do we practice as a team right obviously um everybody has real life going on right if you're especially at the divisional level everybody has a job guys have families guys have kids you know that that have events going on like my son just started baseball season so saturdays right now in the mornings are baseball you know we do we go to those baseball games and and watch him go run around and whack the tar out of the ball uh just like his well probably better than his daddy used to <laughs> um but uh you know people got real life going on um, people have you know emergencies that come up and that all has to be understood but at the same time if we're a serious team we're looking to win at events we're looking to move to the next level we need to have structured practices you know not just hey Sunday we're going to meet at the field and run points all day that's not a practice guys that is you going up and running points to the team 
you know that's yes it's going to help you gel as a unit yes it's going to make you better paintball players just by repetition but that's not a practice you know practice is hey guys this weekend saturday we're going to show up we're going to run drills for most of the day we're going to end with a few maybe three on threes or one on ones or whatever uh, to close out the practice but we're going to run a structured team practice saturday then sunday we're going to start you know by maybe running some one-on-ones and then we move into hey we're going to run a match with this other team we've we've talked to scheduled a, a straight up 12 minute x-ball format match with them and then we're just going to run into random points with the walk-ons you know we're going to get as many reps in as we can that's a practice you know uh, and the thing that separates really especially in paintball that separates practice from just being out there and playing on a sunday is that structure is that plan is that getting that whole group of guys and gals on the same sheet of music saying this is what we're going to do this is how we're going to break it down these are the things the tasks that we want to get done these are the drills that we want to do and knowing going in like hey we're, we're going to go warm up uh, stretch gives you sliding drills snap shooting drills we're going to we're going to do the little things the fundamentals first and we're going to get into actual structured um, participation type stuff um, and how often do you do that so like i said everybody has real life going on so you want to take that into consideration whether you're the coach or just a, a player on the team but i would say um, for a divisional team a minimum of twice a month a minimum of a, of a Saturday, Sunday weekend, twice a month at the bare bones, right? Like obviously a lot of guys and gals are out there every weekend, right? So that makes practice pretty easy to be like, hey, you know, this weekend, instead of just going out there and doing our own thing, we're going to go do a structured practice. And you can do that. Hey, let's do it three weeks out of the month or all every weekend out of the month. I don't care how many you want to do. Just at the very minimum needs to be two a week, two a month, you know, uh, because paintball is so unique in the fact that every other sport are they're practicing five days a week six days a week you know uh, they may have one off day before a game they may take two off days every now and then if they had like you know a, a back-to-back situation or something like that but for the most part they're practicing four five six days a week um, and then they're playing their games on the weekend paintball most people, unless you've got a field that's open seven days a week or you've got a really awesome deal with your local field where they give you access to it during the week or, you know, on Friday so you get an extra day, um, you're getting two days a weekend. You know, you're getting two days a weekend. That's that's eight days a month that you get to actually practice your craft. Makes it really, really, really hard to um, make those jumps in the divisional level or make those jumps in personal skill level uh, as a paintball player if you're only getting in eight days a month right and so along with practice it has to be like you have to have some time put in on your own find a way to either go to your backyard um, go to a empty abandoned parking lot or just do it and get some of those pickle balls those little rubber atomic balls from ANS gear that don't break stuff and you can snap shoot in your house you know find some way to put in a little bit more than just the two days a weekend because i guarantee you the second you start putting in a little bit more every day you're putting in like hey 10 minutes a day i'm doing snap shooting drills you know i'm either going to go out in my backyard and snap shoot or i'm going to go in the house with a pickleball set up in a hallway and snap shoot um, however you do it um, if i'm putting in just a little bit just you know 20 10 20 minutes a day during the week more than just the two days on the weekend you're going to be really surprised in the leaps and bounds you take as a player the next time you're at an event um, or even the next time you're at practice you're like holy crap man now my snapshot is dead on now i'm you know i'm able to run through and do do two packs three packs i'm getting a better understanding of the game or better just technical skills just from putting in that extra 10 minutes a day right because i guarantee you uh, pros and other uh, other guys in the sport are probably putting in more than just 10 minutes a day you know people that are really they, they have a goal for themselves and they they're not going to let anybody deny them those are the guys that they show up one season they're d4 and it feels like a year later they're playing semi-pro and you're like how the hell did this happen well that guy's putting in that extra effort so as a coach with that practice schedule we also need to encourage our teams to um 
put in that extra 10 minutes a day, put in that extra five minutes a day, put in any out amount of extra time and you'll be super surprised at the results or try and work a local deal with your field owner. You know, if you're, if you're, um, you've got one field that you play out of, which I mean, if you're a competitive tournament team, most guys, they have one field that they play out of because that's, uh, that's the field you're going to try and do your sponsorship deals with. That's the place where you get all your stuff. That's the place where you practice all the time. Uh, Go to that field owner and say, hey, man, we really want to represent this field the best way we can. Can we get access to the field on Friday to run a practice? Or can we get access to it on a Monday to run a practice? You know, everybody has Monday off. Can we use the field Monday? Uh, most most field owners, if you're going to go to them and that you have that good relationship with them, they're already sponsoring you, probably going to be pretty agreeable to it because, you know, they only have to open up one field. They're like, hey, we'll turn on the air, air stations and you guys go to town. Have fun, man. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, I had a cold. It's kicking my butt. But anyway, so to cover, to kind of put a bow on that, the how many practices a month should we have at, at minimum two? Um, ideally, every weekend. Um, you know, ideally you're out there every weekend. You know, and your guys know, hey, Saturday's drill day. We're gonna go out. We're gonna run drills, whatever those drills are. And then Sunday, we're gonna run a match, maybe two matches, and points. You know, and we're gonna put those reps in, actually putting all those drills and fundamentals we worked on yesterday putting them all together into a point um so the second question is what what does a paintball practice look like right like so what does your drill day look like um for us and for me personally um drill day is it's going to start with fundamentals and then slowly evolve into putting those fundamentals to work in situational drills um I'm a huge fan of situational drills. I think 80% of teams, I mean, and I'm just making this number up, but at least from what I've seen um, both at national events and at my field with, with the teams we have here, we have about, I'd say about six teams that run out of dynamic, pretty pretty much uh, only run out of dynamic. Um, that uh, the, the issue they have is not that they are just terrible paintball players or they're bad break shooters or bad gun battlers it's that they don't know how to close a point and so they do great getting to their spots shooting off the break they may shoot a guy or two off the break they get to their spots they start making their moves and then all of a sudden a penalty happens or two guys get blown up and you have a side blown open and you end up in a situation where you have to learn how to adjust your game plan and close and they don't know how to do that because they don't practice it because instead of running a structured practice and running matches so you're running against that same team you run a point two minutes get air get paint get wiped off and get back out on the field um, they're running a point or two points and they're they're BSing in the pits for 20 minutes and they go right out right out and run another two points and so it's gonna take a lot longer to figure out how to win points that way versus running island drills or low body situations or high body situations uh, running communication drills running um, uh, breakout or sliding drills, stuff like that. Like, well, breakout sliding doesn't really apply, but uh, m you know, mainly stuff like low body, high body, um, and island drill. Those are really three drills that you can run, and you could really glean a lot of information from that and learn how to close some points uh, because you have to be able to adjust once stuff happens because the game plan only lasts usually only lasts the breakout, right? Like, you know, I sit there and I draw on my uh, my my notes or do it up on the computer all these really pretty graphics about okay we're gonna shoot this guy off the break then once we get here we're gonna we're gonna look here to try and shut down this section of the field and then you're gonna move up to here but it, it rarely lasts that long it usually only lasts the break and so I've learned to kind of adjust my game plans like yes these are the moves I'd like you to make but we're really focusing on getting to our spot alive and where is our assignment for each player once we make it alive right that's what i want to focus on as a coach because if i'm doing my job and i'm teaching them showing them how to close points and adjust correctly i don't need to worry about secondary tertiary moves necessarily obviously i want to put them in the game plan that's that that goes without saying but um i'm not necessarily worried about those moves as much as i am making to their spot alive and then where are they supposed to be shooting, right? They know where they're supposed to be shooting because then if we lose a guy off the break or if 
one of their dudes makes an excellent shot across a bounce shot across the field and shoots a guy out and now our one on the snake side has no back player protecting him how do we adjust to that right like how do we move a guy over there to fill out and protect our snake player so he can do his job and go out there and take a two for one off the field take two players for his one body off the field um, those adjustments are learned in those drills in those situationals so for me we're always going to start with basics right we're gonna before we do anything obviously we're going to run a couple laps to warm our bodies up we're going to do a team stretch and we're going to do a team breakout like i know it sounds silly it sounds like something you would do in high school baseball right like you know the little rah rah stuff but honestly it is a huge piece of what makes paintball a team sport right like we have to learn to be a team and that means doing some of the stuff that we may think is silly like putting our hands in a circle and saying go team uh, may seem silly but it's part of building that relationship with your team and building that brotherhood sisterhood uh, building those bonds and it's a little bit of part of that right like if if I it's something so simple right if I let all my players like hey go get warmed up right and I just tell them hey go get warmed up we'll meet on the field in 10 minutes right and they all go to their their go their own ways and they do their own stretches and they do their own jogging and they do their own little uh, psych up stuff then we're not functioning as a team in that aspect right to be great to, to go the difference between you know being good and being great is something simple like doing your stretches and warming up as a team right doing the little things as a team helps you build those bonds that are going to help you when when the game plan goes to hell right um and like i said it's something simple but that that's that's how we're going to start then we're going to go into basics right we're going to do some breakout slides right like we're going to practice sliding into the snake sliding into the doritos we're going to practice going face up face down slide we're going to practice baseball slide then we're going to practice some snapshots right like we're going to get into dorito one a tower a cake a mini temple a can and we're going to do snapshots out of each one of those right on targets um, and then we're going to go and move, evolve that into hey, I'm going to put this guy in so I'm going to pop out snap a couple rounds off and then I'm going to make my move so we're going to do pop out one two three okay I hit him three times then I go or like hey I'm going to pop twice hit him three times each time and then pop out of the other side of the bunker and make a different move right we're going to do something simple like that so we're going to do some snap shooting we're going to do some snap shooting and moving um, then we're going to go to breakout shooting right we're going to set up a couple targets at this going into the snake going into the doritos going into the home and we're going to practice shooting all three of those targets right until we can pull up and one ball that target every time uh, not you know not every time but we're going to pull it until we can consistently hit that shot right uh, obviously paintballs are only as accurate as the manufacturer can make them round if they're perfectly round they'll shoot dead nuts every time but not every paintball is perfectly round even the higher end stuff like i've had uh bought cases of hk uh, tournament paint at national events come out and half the bag is dimpled so it's not going to shoot perfectly straight it'll shoot straight enough but it's not going to shoot perfectly straight so we want to get our accuracy to an acceptable level right like we're hitting it four out of five times or eight out of ten times something like that um, before we move on to the next thing once we've done those three drills those are really three of our fundamental drills that we do then we're going to start to do some situational stuff right um, we're going to do some um, movement snap shooting drills where we have a guy in the corner, a guy in snake one, right? Guy in the corner is going to snap out, put the guy in the corner in. He's not going to come off that guy, right? Like, so we're teaching that guy, hey, once you get that guy tucked in, let him go. But then he has to communicate to his front player, like, hey, he's in, go, right? And we have an action word for that, right? Like, each team should have a set of action words because. As the opposing player, like let's put it from the perspective of the bad guy, if I hear their corner dude and I'm, you know, maybe the snake two or maybe I'm the the three but I'm inset from the snake shooting snake side and I hear the corner guy say he's in move, okay, now I know the front snake player is going to be moving somewhere. He's either be, the guy's either going to go into the snake or he's going to be going up the snake. So if I have a shot, now's the time to take it, right? So we want to develop an action word. <clears throat> excuse me that lets that front guy know hey i've got him in go uh, so we're going to do drills like that we'll do the same drill on the dorito side 
Uh, then we're going to do drills where um, from the center where we're going to kind of uh, communicate between whoever's shooting in, whoever's shooting out. Like we're, we have, we've got crossed up guns from the home player and the maybe the Dorito one player. Um, you know, a call for him to switch his gun, right? So we're going to practice those switch calls so that we can get those going in the game. You know, it's little stuff, little bitty stuff, right? We want to do all the little things right. If you do the little things right, you're going to win a lot of events. You're going to win a lot of games that way because other teams struggle and it always seems like, oh, man, well, if this guy wouldn't have slid in here. Well, no, man, your quarter player didn't put the dude in like he was supposed to or wasn't looking where he was supposed to go, and that's why your front player died, right? So small stuff, little bitty drills, communication drills are crucial to having success out there on the field. So we're going to run some calm drills, right? Uh, then we're going to run into our, our drill situationals for uh, more of a actual playing style. So we're going to go some island drill. We're going to put two guys on one side, one guy on the other against two guys on one side and one guy on the other on each side and see you can put it together the fastest, right? We're trying to spread the field, communicate. What's our call for uh, to let our other players know, hey, I'm on an island over here? Like, that's another call we need to generate that tells our guys, like, hey, we have one dude all by himself over there. We've got to figure a way to spread the field and make it even so that they don't put it together and say, oh, shoot, okay, we've got a two-on-one on this side. Let's go ahead and shoot that dude out. And then we're a three-on-two, and we can go punish those other guys, right? We have to develop those calls that let those guys know. So we were going to run an island drill. Um, excuse me. We're going to run a bunch of situationals where we, we run random body counts. We're going to do some three-on-three. Three. We're going to do some three-on-two. We're going to do some three-on-one, some two-on-one, some one-on-ones. You know, we're going to run all types of situational closing drills uh, that help us learn how to finish those points out. Um, and then after that, uh, if we have the bodies, we'll run some just fun three-on-three -three matches or five-on-five -five matches, depending on how many players we got, right? Uh, we'll, fin we'll finish with like a little scrimmage um, or some uh, just for, for fun, maybe do some funny one on one drills where we do like a hip draw or we do just a one ball snapshot. We play hopper ball, you know, something like that where we, we're, we're doing some, some fun stuff to finish out the practice. And then we'll have a little, you know, kind of team meeting before we close, talk about, you know, what we thought went really well with the practice, what we thought we did really poorly and what we want to improve on for next time, right? And then the plan for the next day. So we did Saturday is our drill day. So we did our drills. We did our little scrimmage. We, we, we're closing it out. Okay, tomorrow I let them know, hey, at 9 o'clock we need to be on the field, on the box, ready to go because we're playing, you know, uh, Spicy Boys or uh, Vital Instincts or we're playing uh, Arson or one of, one of the other teams out of our field. Like, hey, Saturday, tomorrow morning we've got a match against those guys. We're going to run 12-minute X-ball format. So we need to show up, you know, uh, show up at 7 or 7.30. That gives us an hour and a half to get all of our gear on, to get stretched, to get ready, to get paint, to get pods ready, to get everything ready we need to, need to have ready to go be on the box ready to roll at 9 o'clock. Um, and then we'll run a match or two matches if we can get it. Uh, if we can get more than one team to scrimmage us, we'll scrimmage more than one team because – that does a several, several things for you as a team. First, it teaches you, you know, how to play and win in an actual X-ball match, right? Versus just running one point, one point, one point, you know? Um, secondly, the, and the biggest thing it teaches you is how to run the pit, right? Like so many teams, especially younger teams, like at our, our field, we have, like I said, six or seven teams that run out of there. There's, I think three or four now have actually competed in an event like actually went and competed either at the local regional or national level and competed in an event together um, but one of the things that really holds a lot of those teams back and is the reason they lose matches and lose in the tournament is that they don't know how to run a pit and when you go into their pit if you could be a fly on the wall when they come in off the off the field after their point it's a madhouse Everybody's talking. Nobody's, you know, every stand, some guys are standing around not knowing anything. Some guys are trying to wipe everybody down. Some guys are trying to figure out, you know, how much pain or air they have. And then everybody's talking about why they got shot, how they lost the point, or how they won the point, where everybody's shooting, what's wrong with the game plan, right? 
when you're in a pit, guys and gals, um, there needs to be one voice, right? The only person that should be talking should be the coach. Unless he's like, hey, so-and-so, where did you get shot from? Or did you die off the break or did you make it into your spot alive? And honestly, as a coach, when my guys are coming in off the field during a point, if I had a guy get shot off the break, like, hey, man, where would you get shot from? I ask him that question before we even get everybody in. That way I don't need to ask the question again when we're sitting there in the pit. We've got two minutes to go to get back on the field. So the only person that should be talking should be the coach, right? And the only thing the coach should be saying is like, hey, good job, bad job, um, this point, you go here and shoot this, or hey, we're going to stay with, with whatever play we're running, or we're going to go to this play, or we're going to stay with this play, but I want so-and-so to shoot this lane instead of that lane, right? If that makes any sense. <clears throat> but you should have one guy running the, the show in the, in the pits, right? You, you know, ideally you have some pod runners, either guys that, that guys and girls that aren't playing right then, they go run pods, um, and then you need to have someone in, in charge of wiping, making sure players are checked while they're walking out on the field that they're wiped off all the way. And then you need to have one person, you know, and these are usually players or like if you have a significant other that will help in the pit or a parent that will help in the pit or whoever, uh, but they're not talking while they're doing this. They are just doing whatever a job they're assigned, right? They're getting paint for the players. They're filling up air tanks for the players. They're wiping down the players, or they're going and getting pods. Those are really the only four things that need to be happening in between point one, point two, point three, or point four, right? Um, and then, like I said, you designate one person, and it can be someone who was like, "Hey, you're you're getting." filling up their pods and then when you're done that i want you to stand by the net where they're going to go in and as they're walking on check for any paint that's missing because the last thing we want is one of our guys getting called out for a hit that happened on the last play point right that's that's just an a absolute no-no something you should be able to avoid pretty easily um, by just assigning one person to say, hey, before the guys walk on at the net, I want you to check each one of them. And you don't have to stop them and roll them around. Just make sure you're looking at their packs. Make sure you're looking at the, the tanks, hoppers, tops of the heads, you know, whatever it is. Uh, legs, you know, usually it's the back of the leg. I see that all the time where a guy has an old hit on the back of the leg that he just didn't wipe off when he came out of the pit. So he's standing at the box, and then someone at the box notices and has to wipe him off. Um, just avoiding those simple little things. Um, sorry, I'm looking at my notes. Um, uh, but that, like I said, is one of the biggest, biggest issues for, for younger teams and divisional teams in general is their pits are pure chaos, right? And if it's chaos in there, nobody's going to be able to go back out on the field. Like you may have had a good game plan going in. But because there's so much chaos going on, guys are getting distracted and they're confused about are we sticking with what we're doing or are we doing something different, that they get on the box and they have no idea what they're doing. They're just like, all right, I guess I'm going to go do this. Or you have a player. So this is another, uh, it's a huge pet peeve of mine, but also it's a, it's a big no-no as a player, right? Unless you're a pro, which, you know, most I'm not, and none of the guys I play with are, unless you're a pro, don't be changing the game plan on the box, that is not the time to do that. You know, when someone um, changes stuff on the box, the rest of the team usually doesn't hear it. And so now the guy coming off of his, his assignment to do something else is really, really putting the game plan at risk because there's a good reason dude was shooting where he was supposed to be shooting, right? Um, so don't change stuff on the box. If you want to change something and you think you're going to do it on the box, tell the coach, be like, hey, man, what about this, right? Ask that question um, and, uh, and get, that, get that answer, get that talked about before you go out there. You shouldn't be game, sh changing game plans on the box. That should never happen. Um, anyway, but, yeah, uh, when there's pure chaos in your pit, it, it makes things a lot harder uh, on your team to win. It, it puts you at an immediate disadvantage. Uh, you know, an immediate uphill battle. Just, uh, it just does. So um, those running practices like that on Sundays, running actual matches, helps you learn, okay, we have a really hard time in the pit, right? Like we're struggling to get back on the box in two minutes or too many people are talking or people are getting confused on what we're supposed to be doing, right? Or we don't have enough helpers. We need to like designate, okay, hey, can we get these people in here to do this, right? Um, 
it'll help you identify all that stuff before you get to a tournament because that's the last place you want to be like oh shit you know we don't have a pod runner oh man we don't have anybody to wipe people down or fill pods like you know we once we get through our first our first batch of pods we're screwed you know so <clears throat> excuse me identifying all those things before you get to the tournament is huge if you can do that in practice then and you'll see the huge difference of a team that is has a completely calm pit a very well organized and well run pit versus a team that doesn't uh you can even see that at the pro level sometimes like you'll see one pit like you watch the dynasty pit it's maybe ryan or yosh or alex or marcello one guy talking to the coach the coach telling everybody where he wants them to shoot and there's no other talking in the pit but you see a different uh a different team you know i, I won't name names because i you know i'm not a pro player so um but you see some teams and you see their pit and there's guys yelling at each other yelling at the coach you know arguing about what happened the last point and it's complete pandemonium right uh even at the pro level so learning how to handle your pit at a, a at a professional uh, level or handle your pit in an organized level organized fashion is is huge uh, huge for events and that's usually what our practices look like um and uh, when you're doing that like when you're if you're the coach or you're just the captain or whoever's in charge of organizing practice um having stuff like making a note like i have notes here for the podcast and stuff i want to talk about points at specific points i want to hit um uh having a schedule of what you want to do how long it should take and you know how much paint roughly you think is going to be needed for that day is a huge bonus and it shows you as the captain or coach or whoever it shows a lot of um maturity in you i guess uh as the coach uh, captain or whoever to especially like your sponsors are going to see that stuff like I promise you, like, uh, if, you're, if your local field is your sponsor and you are the captain of your field, you're running practice on a Saturday, and he sees you out there looking at your sheet saying, okay, hey, guys, we got 30 minutes to do this drill. And then you run the drill, you go back to the sheet, hey, guys, we got 40 minutes to run this drill, right? Or we need this much paint, go get 10 cases or however. And they see, like, you taking that initiative to run a very strict scheduled practice, a very professional-looking practice, a uh, very organized one, they're going to see that and be like, damn, like, I, I, you know, these guys are, are doing big things and, uh, that a lot of times will lead to help for you down the road when it comes to like, Hey, you know, we really want to go to this event or we want to re-talk about our sponsorship deal, maybe, you know, or talk about a sponsorship deal, period, stuff like that will really look, uh, look good on you as a team and as a coach or a captain when it comes to other people, uh, seeing you and not that you should do it for other people to see but it just is a byproduct of that, right? Like people notice that. Even your teammates will notice that or your team will notice that. They'll see like this guy is not not screwing around, you know? Um, he's, he's taking the time to put it all together to make sure it's organized, to make sure it's nice and clean and everybody has what they need, everything is organized and it just, it, it, it just makes everything so much smoother. I promise you, just, just try it, right? Just try it. Um, and then, uh, so that's, like I said, that's our schedule. We want to have it, um, we want to have it scheduled out. Um, and you don't have to do it like minute by minute. You just say, Hey, this is the drill I want to run. This is like warm ups, right? So like, Hey, 10 minutes for warm ups, you know, 10, 20 minutes for warm up stretching, um, or prior team meeting prior to practice. Um, then, you know, 15 minutes for sliding drills. Uh, and then, uh, 15 minutes for snapshot snapshooting drills or 30 minutes for snapshooting drills you know um or an hour on snapshooting drills then we've got you know um breakout shooting we're going to give that another 20 minutes and then we're going to do uh communication drills that's another 20 minutes and then 30 minutes of situational drills or an hour of situational drills then we break for like a little bit of like water break or lunch or whatever we want to do then we get into more drills right um having stuff like that will really uh, up your game as a coach and, and up your team's uh, ability as a team oh excuse me <clears throat> all right so all right so uh practice paint right how much paint are you shooting that's that's one of the one of the big questions right how much paint should we be shooting um what kind of paint should we sh we should we be shooting um 
all that kind of stuff. And most of that is going to be dictated by your sponsorship level or your paint deal with your local field or however that goes, right? Um, practice paint and, and the amount doesn't really matter, right? Like how much paint you put through your gun does not tell me how good of a paintball player you are. Like you could be putting 10 cases through your gun on a weekend and still not be able to hit shit on a, on a target, right? Um, you should be able to ideally with 10 cases, but you may not be. And you may be a guy that goes through one case a weekend is out there just one ball in the hell out of people and dicing up, you know, getting a three pack every point, right? Uh, the amount of paint is not as much as, as important as how we utilize that paint, right? Like how we, how we utilize the shooting drills that we are doing. Okay. And, uh, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me, but uh, I think I really love what um, Tyler and Marcelo um, their theory on it is on keeping a bag for each player for the end of the day to do individual drills with. Absolutely, absolutely freaking lutely, right? You know, when you're when you're done for practice on a Saturday, everybody like hey, give everybody a bag. Be like hey, dude, use with this, use this paint as you want, right? Go do snap shooting drills or whatever you want to work on personally. Um, but, uh, ideally like on drill day, um, you know, probably two, three cases a player depends, you know, like drills, you're usually using a lot less paint. So maybe one case, two cases a player. Um, it really doesn't matter how much paint, right? Um, but I will say the kind of paint is, is important, right? Uh, we're very lucky at my home field at Dynamic that the base paint we're shooting is, uh, so we shoot Vulcan New World or Vulcan Graffiti um, at Dynamic for the speedball field, which are two, like New World itself is a really great practice paint. Like it's, I don't, the level, I think it's level three, but it's consistent, it shoots straight, it breaks, it's brittle, it's perfect. For a practice paint and it's really it's comparatively really inexpensive and then the graffiti we take that next step up you're getting into some like level four style paint where you're, you're shooting close to a tournament ball um we're very fortunate to have that good paint like you want to shoot as good a paint as you can in practice because you want your balls to fly straight you want to know you want to get that feedback on your accuracy and you want balls to break right we don't want to be shooting bouncy balls at practice um, some fields aren't that lucky, you know, some teams aren't that lucky that their local field, because most fields are running field paint only, and they're shooting field grade paint, you know, you're kind of limited on what you can do. Um, not what you can do, but you're kind of limited on the capability of that paint. Um, you're going to get bounces, it's going to be inconsistent size, it's going to, you know, shoot all over the place sometimes. Um, and that's just how it is. Um, but. I think if you're if you're a team that has paint sponsors or a sponsorship deal with the field where they cut you a good deal on paint, um, trying to figure out as a coach, like it, you know, the first couple practices, just let them run with and say, hey, each guy get, just say, let's say a case, right, and then you find out on drill day, okay, we're every guy's averaging about a case and a half. Okay, so I want to average, we'll just say, round it up, say two cases, so two cases per player uh, for paint. And doing little stuff like that, it's it's really something you don't necessarily need to do as a coach. Like, that's that's something probably more on the player when it comes to practice, depending on how your paint situation works. If you're not getting, a, you know, your own skid delivered every weekend. Um, but little stuff like that, like saying, hey, you know, we're going through this much case on, this much paint on practice day, this much paint on uh, drill uh, points day or match day or whatever you want to call it, Sunday. Um, so this is how much we're going through in a weekend. Let's average that out. Let's figure out the cost of that, and let's try and figure out a way as a team that we can best pay for that, right? And keep our, uh, you know, keep it reasonable because especially at the divisional level, most teams are uh, they're paying for their own stuff uh, unless you unless you get really lucky and have a great sponsor. Um, or a great deal with your field. Like, we have a really great deal with our field, so it's not as much of an issue. But, um, like, small stuff like that. And then when you build your sponsor deck and you're going to other sponsors and saying, hey, we'd love for you to, to, to sponsor the team, we'd love to be, rep your brand, 
and you can give them information like that like say you know not just how many events we play and where we play them but be like this is how much paint we go through in in a month or this is how much paint we go through on the average weekend this is the cost of that these are the different costs like showing your potential sponsor your costs as a team and they can say okay well they'll look at it and if they decide to cover you they're like hey uh, we want to sponsor you. We're going to cover this, this, and this because they've looked at your cost sheet and they see how much money it run, costs to run that paintball team, and they want to help. You know, they they may not be like, okay, we're going to sponsor your events uh, or travel, but we'll cover paint at the event. You know, and okay, that's one huge relief as a as a team, uh, as a captain or manager or coach. Like, okay, cool. No, don't have to worry about paint. Now we got to attack travel. Okay, how are we going to cover travel? Let's go find another sponsor for that. Um, <clears throat> doing stuff like that as the coach as the captain super important um, because one it shows initiative two it shows your team that you care about them that you take your job seriously you take the the position that they've given you because really the team picks the coach you know the team picks the captain they pick the coach and when they pick you you want to make them proud like you should want to make them proud so doing little stuff like that is is super important I'm working on building the cost sheet for our teams and uh, I'll probably try and figure out a way to put that out uh, to folks that want it, whether they um, comment on the YouTube or send me a message on uh, Instagram or something like that, because I'll have a link to the YouTube on the on the podcast page, um, and I'll have a link to the podcast on the YouTube page, so you'll be able to do both, and um, uh, hopefully we can figure out a way to... Um, to get that to info to people because I think that's that's something that be be uh, hopefully people want if they do want it then then absolutely. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, uh, those those things doing taking the initiative, showing your team that you take the position they've given you seriously. I mean that that goes a huge way in them giving you the confidence in a game to be like, okay, uh, I don't really understand why Tom told me to do this, but I trust him. Uh, he's shown that he puts the work in, so I'm gonna. I'm just gonna trust him, and I'm gonna do what he asks, right? It it helps build that rapport with your team and build that trust, which you desperately need as a coach, to be effective, um, in those situations. So something little like figuring out how much paint we're going through, how much that's gonna cost, how much that's gonna, and extrapolating that info out to uh, the year and the month, um, is isn't is awesome. I mean, it's just something a little bit extra you can do. Like I said, just like building the practice schedule, doing little things like that will show your team you take you take this seriously, you want them to succeed, and it will help build that trust, I promise you. Um, so paint management, uh, now that we've kind of talked about paint cost and, and how much, paint management, right? Uh, that's something I think everybody sort of knows or is aware of, but when it comes to the event, they get distracted, they don't really pay attention, and then come Sunday or come the afternoon games, uh, their paint is swelled up, it's bouncing all over the place, or they're chopping the hell out of it because they don't have it bored correctly. Uh, that kind of stuff will cost you point, points, cost you events, right? Uh, and again, you're limited on the type of paint that the event offers, so we recently went to RMPL1, um, and we were getting paint Sunday morning, and so Saturday I missed because uh, I, it was right after I'd hurt my knee, and uh, I, like I said, my son's playing baseball, so I was at his uh, baseball game, and uh, just wasn't able to make the matches because both the matches were super early in the morning, and I couldn't make them. Uh, but Sunday I showed up, and we're getting paint, and I like I look at the box, and I didn't notice at first, and then I was like, oh, okay. I was looking at the paint, and I was like, this is interesting, and I looked at the box again, and it said field paint. It was GI one star field paint uh, for a tournament. That's insane. That is, that's insane to me. Uh, like that you as a tournament director would only offer field grade fucking paint. Uh, excuse, part of my language. That's terrible, right? Like if you, that, that's terrible. Um, but you're limited by that, right? So, um, how do we get around that? Well, let's make sure we keep it cool. So it's at least brittle, like hopefully a little bit more brittle. If we cool it down, beat in the cooler, because it was probably like 50 degrees that morning, which isn't super cold. Um, I know like depending on where you're watching from or where you're from, it may be really cold, but Colorado, that's not really cold. 
Um, so throw it in the cooler with your ice that you've prepared for the day. Like so, um, like one thing you should do if you're the coach, either find out who has one or get one because they're like forty bucks at Walmart. Get a long cooler. Get one of those big coolers, right? Like not not a tiny little baby one. Get a long cooler, a hundred gallon or so, and you're gonna get probably two two to three ten pound bags of ice. Lay them still in the bag. You don't need to break the ice open unless you really want to. Lay the bags in the, uh, of ice on the bottom. Then take your cases of paint, rip rip the cardboard open, full, unfold it, put that over top of the uh, ice. Then when you fill your pods um, or you have cases that you haven't opened yet, put those in the cooler. Um, that way they stay nice and cool all day long uh, and your paint will break all day long right it will stay either stay however it is or it will like recure if it's uh if it started to swell a little bit um and become like a jelly ball um but uh doing that kind of stuff managing your paint that that small simple stuff that's just one of the steps but doing that simple step will keep your paint from turning into bouncy balls in the afternoon which is terrible i mean it it sucks to lose a match because you're bouncing the hell out of people, right? Like you're watching your balls just bounce off people. Um, or it's just flying all over the place and, or turning into soup in your barrel, right? Like, like losing an event or losing a match because of paint is unacceptable. It, it just flat out is. And like I said, you're kind of limited in some tournaments because of what they offer at the event. Um, and if you're an event person and uh, you're watching this, um, please know that I don't personally think anybody is bad or stupid or anything like that. I just think as, as a player, um, as a person who's played this game for 1998 to 20 something years, 24 years almost, um, that having low grade paint, like anything lower than a level three paint at an event is unacceptable like from the player perspective because we're paying a lot of money to come to your event i mean some events aren't expensive to, to enter that's always nice um and it, and the saying is true you get what you pay for but it, going to an event and paying you know a 500 hundred dollar plus entry fee um or like some events you know it's a thousand dollars plus to enter uh like if, if i went to an nxl event and paid you know fifteen hundred dollars for the entry fee and then got there and found out they had field paint at the uh, event, I would just, honestly, I would want to, I'd be tempted to just go to the director and say, hey, give me my money back, take us off the list, we're, we're out of here. You know, uh, that's unacceptable. I mean, you're, if you're putting on an event uh, and you want to provide the best possible experience for your players, provide the best possible gameplay for your players, we're, we're willing to pay the extra five, 10 bucks for high level paint. But paying, I think it was like 45 or 48 bucks a case for field grade paint is unacceptable. Like, I mean, I pay that for, for freaking Falcon Graffiti at my home field for our practice paint, right? Like, that's, that's terrible uh, because it, it, not just that it's, it's, it's low level paint and isn't consistent, doesn't shoot straight, doesn't break straight, or doesn't break consistently, um, it's that... We're, we're trying to go out there and win money or win a, win a trophy, win an event, and there's a high likelihood that we'll have issues because of the level of paint, and it provides a bad player experience, and that's what they remember, right? Like, they may not remember that the refing at RMPL1 was out fucking standing. Sorry, pardon my language. The RMPL1 event refing was some of the best I've seen. Like, it was better than both NXL events I went to last year at the divisional level. Better than both of them. Uh, they were consistent. They didn't change the outcome of games. They didn't affect the outcome of games, which is, I love that as a player. I never want to see the referee affecting the outcome, right? Like, yes, they need to call penalties when there are penalties, but there's some stuff you can let slide and not affect the, the outcome the, of the game um, and still, still do your job. They were outstanding. But that's not the one thing I remember from the event. The thing I remember is that I was paying so much money for trash paint like uh, it's just it's just not not uh 
not providing the best possible experience as for your players or for the teams competing. Uh, like I said, almost every one of payball players will say, yeah, if you charge me five bucks more, but I'm shooting four star or five star or three star even, yeah, sure, I'll pay the extra five bucks, ten bucks. Absolutely. Um, so, sorry, that's, a, that's just an off-topic rant. But, um, uh, yeah, anyway, because that, that pain is hard to manage. But anyway, so the ice, the ice, putting the pods in the ice chest with, uh, with the ice with the cardboard down over the top of it helps keep that paint cold and brittle most of the day uh, or all the day. <clears throat> uh, then on top of that, when do we buy our paint? How much paint do we buy, right? Um, so, you know, figuring out part of – like I said earlier about figuring out how much paint you're going through on the weekend will help you figure out how much you're going through in a match, right? That'll really help get you in and be like, hey, we ran two matches uh, at practice of full of straight up X ball. We went through 25 cases. Okay, probably need 25 cases for the day. Um, but I, do I want to buy all 25 right off the get? No, I'm going to buy all the paint I need for that first match I'm going to buy it 30 minutes before the first match, right? I know that sounds like it's cutting a little bit close, but every second I can keep the paint in the paint trailer with the, the AC going uh, and keep it or keep it cold in my cooler, every second counts, right? Because especially when you're playing in the summer or if you're playing in a high humidity area like Texas or Florida, um, that paint will just start to swell and you've got a really short window. So uh, 30 minutes before the event, me and whoever will go buy the paint, right? We'll, we'll, ta we'll tag some people to go buy paint, right? We give them the money or uh, if like in an Excel event, they give you the cards. Uh, however they do it, you go get your paint 30 minutes before and then we start potting it. So we buy it and then we pot it, right? That way, by the time we're done potting, we're probably at about 15 minutes or so before the match starts. Time to get ready to get into the pit, right? So we probably, well, we're going to get paint the other guys and gals will be going and getting pre-staged at whatever pit we're going to use, right? So they're going to be there, ready with the cooler, with all the pods, all the whatever we use to fill pods, whether it's the paint caddies or one of the, the auto pod fillers, however you do it. But 30 minutes prior, go buy the paint, bring it straight to the pit you're going to play in because we're going to go ahead and pre-stage out there. We're going to start filling pods, and we're going to fill every single pod we can. Every single one. Like that first, that paint you buy for the match, unless you run out of pods, should not be in a case unopened, right? And if it is, throw that in the cooler. Like put whatever paint you don't open to put in pods or whatever's le left over after you start, after you fill the pods in the cooler with the pods. Uh, that way that paint stays cold and brittle. That way you don't have two cases, like you don't have eight cases of really good paint and then two cases cases of really bouncy swelled up paint because it was out in the sun um same thing with our guns you know we want to keep the guns out of the sun paint out of the sun sun is bad uh does bad things to paint and uh tanks and everything so uh that's that's kind of it as far as paint management and kind of uh closing out the the practice section of of the video um in the podcast so the the next thing i want to talk about is call outs right um when you're running a team or you're the coach, captain, owner, player, whatever, when you're building the call outs for your team, right? There's a few important things you need to think about, right? Like one, my call outs need to be stupid simple. Like there's that old simple uh, saying, kiss, keep it simple, stupid, right? I need my call sheet and my call outs to be so easy that it's hard to forget, right? Like I don't want to overcomplicate and be like, okay, well, if it's at a right angle and the sun is at, you know, three o'clock, it's this call. But if it's, you know, if it's any other situation, it's this call, right? Like, no, you don't need to get into that, right? Because we're gonna have a lot of call outs because we have call outs for the bunkers and then we have action words. So the less I need to remember and the easier things are to remember, the better success we're going to have on the field. Like the last thing you want as a coach is some guy forgetting what the bunker is called and being going old school and be like, oh, it's the one that's shaped like a banana instead of rocket or Cali or whatever, you know. Make it really simple. Make it easy for teams to to remember. And if you can, I mean, 
I know it may look a little bit different, but <clears throat> excuse me, what it's going to be, uh, what what it would look like, you know, not caring is it uh, put a put a quarterback sleeve, those little wristband wrist quarterbacks on your player's arms, or they can put it on like Velcro it to their belt, or uh, however they want to do it, right? But you can do those little arm arm quarterback wrist quarterbacks and put the call sheet right in there. That way, if they forget it, they can just look at it on their wrist while they're shooting and say, oh, okay, it's Cali. All right, cool, that's where the Cali is. But I want to keep it so simple that, that teams have an easy way to remember it, and, and they, they're not going to forget. They're just going to be able to, to go out there and do their job uh, because we're going to have lots of them, right? Um, and then within that call sheet, I want to be able to build um, calls that create – Sorry, I said that wrong. Uh, I want to make calls that can convey a bunch of information with just one word, right? <coughs> Excuse me. As opposed to, like, having to go tell your front guy, like, hey, he's at this bunker, uh, he's looking this way. Uh, you know, instead of all that stuff, I can, you know, say, okay, vampire, or whatever the call is, that tells me the snake one guy's looking inside. You know, that's and that all gets tra- transferred by one word by him saying vampire or viper or cobra or whatever um, I want to build my call outs so that I can convey as much information as possible across the field with a one simple word or two simple words right like t- two words mi- maximum <coughs> excuse me I want to be able to get as much information out as quickly as I can and as effectively as I can so uh, when it comes to call outs, keep it simple and find a way to, within that simplicity, convey a ton of information as easily as possible. And so that's why we use what I call action words, right? So I have my call outs. I'm going to build my sheet of all these bunkers, right? So, like, let's say the Doritos, for instance, right? So I keep it simple. Doritos themselves are 100, 200, 300, 400, and then we have a different call for the 50, right? Um, and I'm gonna, you know, say the temple, or if there's a temple on the Dorito side, it's gonna be called Rocket. If there's a temple on the Snake side, it's gonna be called Seattle, right? Um, or uh, the 50 is Command Center, right? So those are like bunker calls. But if I if I'm on the Dorito side, for instance, let's say uh, I'm the back player, and or I'm the the home player, and I see their Dorito guy get into the 50 Doritos and he's about to wrap and I know hey we're about to lose this point because if he wraps it he can shoot us all I have a call you know let's say it's a uh, red alert and that tells whoever's the f- closest body to that bunker go bunker that guy right like at that point we're making the judgment call that we're willing to trade that body for their body in order to win the point like we're willing to sacrifice that one for one that even swap uh, whereas normally we'd want a, that front guy to take two guys at least, like uh, one body and then his mirror off the field with him. That's really his job, you know. But at that point, we're willing to sacrifice him just taking the one body off the field so we don't lose the point. Uh, doing simple stuff like that. So, you know, I said all I said was red alert or uh, danger, and that tells that guy, hey, go do that, right? Um, or let's say, I, you know, the... Um, trying to think flip-flop right that tells uh you know let's say i'm the corner player and i'm supposed to be looking down the tape and my one is supposed to be looking inside i tell him flip-flop that tells him to switch his gun right tells him to go to the opposite side so it tells him now instead of shooting tape he needs to shoot the instead of shooting inside he needs to shoot the tape or instead of shooting tape he needs to shoot inside right like whoever i'm talking to like i say let's say you know i say kyle and kyle's behind me and i say tell him to flip-flop that tells him like hey he was supposed to be shooting the tape but i need him to shoot inside okay Uh, building calls that create um building action words that create uh um a way to, to communicate as much info as possible with a short either saying or word. Um, and that's what we call action words, right? So I'm going to, each time we, we get a layout, like the action words don't change. They don't change unless someone's caught on to them and we need to change them because everybody's picking that up, uh, which we, we'll talk about next. But uh, unless, unless we need to change it, those action calls are always going to stay the same. 
but the bunker calls will vary slightly depending on the layout. So when we get our layout, right, I get the sheet and I put the layout all on the sheet. So I have, you know, the whatever it is and all of our calls on there. And then on the back of the sheet is all the action words. So they, you know, we re go over, we rehash all the action words every single time so that guys have it so ingrained in their brain they, they can't forget it, right? Um, so that that's that was really all I had on that, that communication uh, calls and action words kind of piece of the show. Um, com communication is one of those things that like you hear it all the time in paintball. Like communication has to be good for a team to have success. If communication's trash, your team's gonna be trash. Right, so uh, building in those ways to make transfer of, of information easy will go a long way in your team's success. Because now, um, yeah, now instead of me having to convey a, a paragraph worth of information to the guy behind me with all the words, I just need one word, right? And that makes it super easy, and it's easy for teams to remember. Uh, the second thing about communication, the last piece I have on it, um, is when we're communicating on the field, um, one, it needs to be loud so that it can be heard by whoever I'm talking to. Um, two, it needs to be a, a good information, right? If I just have one guy yelling 100 for like two minutes, just screaming 100, Okay, dude, we've all heard you. We know that he's in the 100, but I want to know not just where he is, where he's looking, right? That's where we create those action words that tell us, okay, hey, the Dorito front player is looking inside. We have a call for that. Uh, and that and that way, all the team knows Dorito 1 is looking inside. Um, it makes life so much easier. But we, well, one, need to be loud. Two, we need to be conveying good information, right? And asking the right questions, like asking my front player hey can you make the move right i have your guy in can you make the move and if he says no or if he says this guy's stop like he needs to then tell me what's stopping him from making the move right is one of their dudes holding the lane outside of his bunker is uh is he exposed or whatever like what's stopping him that kind of information is what's important to be um transferred out there good information <clears throat> sorry excuse me um then um, the third thing and really the final thing is when I'm talking don't scream into your bunker like I, it's it's insane how many times I see that a guy will literally let's say I'm you're the Dorito I'm facing the screen and I'm yelling um, whatever call I'm yelling directly at the screen directly at the Dorito it's a lot harder for the guys behind me to hear me right uh, and I don't have to, if I'm already on a target and I'm laning or whatever, or if I'm already tucked in, it's super easy for me to just turn my head and yell the information, right? Turn your head to whoever you're talking to. That way they can hear you better because it's a lot harder for your voice to project backwards around your head. It, it's kind of impossible. Um, and it makes it really hard for the back guy to hear, especially when everybody is on the field is shooting. So when I'm talking, turn to who I'm talking to and be loud that's really it so that's that's kind of it for communication on this section um the last topic <clears throat> and one of my favorite topics to talk about is how do we train like a professional right if uh at the beginning of the season whether you're a coach owner player whoever right you need to get together as a team and say what are our goals like what is the goal here um, are we, if we're like, let's say a D3 team, right? We get together and I say, what is our goal? What do we want to achieve? Do we want to win D3 and play in D3 and have a good time? Or are we trying to go to D2? Are we trying to get to semi-pro? You know, are we trying to eventually get in onto that pro field? Is that the goal? What is the goal of this team, right? And if the goal is to progress and to go further and get to that show, okay, how do we do that? All right, we've got to approach practice and drills and things like a professional if you want to be a professional you have to you know pr practice the part you know um you have to train like you practice or uh train like you fight is what the army says um when we're when we're training 
I know it's it's a fun game, and we're out here to, to enjoy it, and we want to have fun with our buddies, our teammates. We don't want it to be just a strict business-like mentality, but it is times, you know, and you have to understand as a team and as a player, time and place, right? So there's a time and a place for us to goof off and have fun and enjoy the day together, right? That's at the tables. You know, that's at the tables when we're setting up our stuff. That's outside the pit when we're not on the field. That's the time to goof off, have fun, enjoy the day together. Um, when we're in the pit or when we're on the field, it's work time, right? We need to approach it like a profession um, and approach it like professionals. Um, that means, you know, we can't be goofing around. We can't be walking. When we're on the field. we got to be moving quickly where we go, get to where we need to be quickly. We need to uh, be serious about all the drills, not goofing around in line, any of that stuff. We need to, um, sorry, <clears throat> we need to approach things like pros, right? And that means don't cheat yourself as well. So when we're in drills, if the drill is, hey, I want you to pop out, and shoot down the tape, I want you to shoot that target three times and then move to the next bunker. Well, don't cheat yourself. When you pop out, and if you shoot it and you miss the first two and you hit it on the third, don't take off, tuck back in, pop back out, hit it another two times. The, the, the drill was to hit it three times and then move, right? So um, don't cheat yourself on drills. Don't goof off and, and slack off in practice. The only person you're hurting is yourself and the actually you're probably hurting the team too um, but if we want to get to the pro level we have to treat this like a profession and professionals put in the extra hours the extra time right so not just at practice do we need to take a kind of workmanlike approach when we're in the pits and when we're on the field like I said when we're off the field have fun enjoy it you know goof around make some jokes do whatever it is your team does to have fun but when you're in the pits, when you're on the field, we're taking it serious. We're attacking it seriously. And we're, we're attacking it to make ourselves the best we can be. But that also means, like, when as a professional, um, a lot of the growth and development of players is done outside of practice. It's done in the time that no one's watching you. Are you doing snap shooting drills at your house on your own? Are you doing? Are you coming out to the field on your own when, you know, maybe the team has the day off and it's, you know, your field's open on, let's say you have a good field, it's open on a Wednesday or something like that. You're the one going out there on Wednesday to go out and, you know, get some work in. You take that extra baggie uh, that we talked about earlier, keeping it for yourself to use on whatever. You're taking that bag and you say, hey, I'm going to fill up my hopper. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to do some snap shooting drills. And then when I feel like I'm, I'm locked in on that, you know, I'm going to spend, you know, 30 minutes on snap shooting, and then I'm going to go spend 30 minutes on breakout shooting and shooting that that uh, that snake lane off the break or shooting that that, uh, that Dorito shoot runner off the break, right? Uh, putting in those extra hours on your own when nobody's watching you and nobody's pushing you to do it is what separates the good from the great and the, uh, the elite from the great. You know, it's what separates the bad, the good, the bad, every level, right? The guys who are up the next level from you are the guys putting in more work than you. And so once you get to that level, it's always about who's putting in the most work, who's putting in the most time, who's take, teaching, treating this like a professional job, like a profession. Um, there's a saying that uh, I had a, an old sergeant major, we were doing some training as uh, we we're getting ready for um, a, uh, a deployment we're going to be attached to uh, special special forces. We're going to be their EOD guys. Um, and we're doing a, a training event, and one of the guys uh, on scene, or on the, the, the lane we were on, started, uh, I forget, he started complaining about something. And the sergeant major stopped the training event, like literally paused it, and just lit into this guy. And then after he was done, they started training again. He came over and he started talking to me. And we were talking about what the difference is between uh, good EOD techs and bad EOD techs. But also what separates, like, what separates special forces from the regular infantry soldier, right? Like, what, what is the thing that makes them different? Um, and he said the thing that makes them different, right, the thing that makes them elite is that a regular infantry guy 
will train a task until he gets it right, right? Until he passes whatever the standard is, whether that's six out of 10 times or eight out of 10 times or whatever it is, right? The regular dude will, will train something until he, he, until he, he accomplishes the, the training objective. He gets an acceptable level. The elite guy, the guy that's a special forces dude, the guy that, that's next level and that, that everybody uh, wants to emulate is the guy who trains a task until he cannot get it wrong. He trains it and literally he, he runs it, whether it's, whether it's um, con shooting controlled pairs or moving and shooting or uh, preparing, um, preparing a casualty for evacuation or calling in a airstrike, whatever it is, whatever the task is that he's training, he trains himself until he cannot get it wrong, until 10 out of 10 times, 20 out of 20 times, I can do this with my eyes closed and still accomplish the task. That's what makes elite people, you know, that's what, that, that's what makes them elite, that's what makes them better, you know, that's what makes uh, dynasty dynasty, that's what makes, you know, um, heat heat. You know, that's what makes those top level teams what they are, right? They do, they practice something until they cannot get it wrong, right? And obviously there's outside factors that can adjust, that can affect them and they don't always win, you know? But when you're talking about the separation of divisional level players or division teams versus pro level teams, right? Pro level teams are training something to a standard that is way above where you are right now, you know? And if you want to get there, you have to approach it like they do. You have to, whatever the drill is I'm doing today. So, you know, when I show up to practice, coach says, hey, we're going to do uh, breakout shooting first. Okay. I'm going to run that breakout shooting drill and approach it the same way they do. I'm going to make this shot until I cannot get it wrong. And if, you know, coach says, hey, that's time to move on. Okay, cool. After practice, I'm going to come right back and I'm going to run that drill until, until I cannot get it wrong. And so when you establish that goal for yourself as a player or as a team and say we want to move up right we want to get to the next level okay well we need to train like we're at the next level and everybody has to buy it everybody has to approach it that way otherwise it's going to be really hard for your team to move up and some teams don't have that goal some teams say hey we like d4 we want to continue to play here okay cool well we're going to focus on how do we beat these other d4 teams okay you know that's what we're going to focus and we're going to train to that level uh, but honestly, those aren't the guys I want to coach. I don't want to coach those guys. I don't want to be around those guys because people that are happy with mediocrity or being where they're at and not constantly pushing to get to that next level are not the kind of people I want to surround myself with. And I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm not saying I don't respect them. I'm not saying anything negative about them except for the fact that I don't like, I don't want to be on the team with you as far as at a, at at a competitive level, like, like in an event. You know, when it comes to at the field, absolutely, I'll run a point with you, I'll jump in, I'll play with whoever wants to play. But when it comes to uh, training and when it comes to events or getting ready for events, I want to surround myself with people that have the same goals in mind that I do. I want to surround myself with people that want to get to a perfection level, an elite level. That's, that's the guys I want on my team. That's the girls I want on my team. That's, that's who I want on my squad. Because if they're not, then they're not going to push as hard as I can. I am. And eventually, my human nature is going to try and pull me to be like, hey, take it easy today. Take, take a rest day. Take a day off. Take a weekend off. You know what? Take two weekends off. You know what? Take a month off. You know what? Uh, let's just play rec ball for a while, you know? Um, and I'm, like I said, I'm not saying that those people are bad or wrong or, or anything negative. Those are just not the people that I want on my team because I want to be with people that want to be elite. Those are the folks I want to be around. So um, when you're approaching practice as a team and as a coach, you need to make sure it is known to everybody on that team like what our goal is as a team. And if our goal is to continue moving up, we have to push hard. Like we have to treat this like a, like a job, you know. Um, and I know a lot of paintball players don't like that because they want it to be just be fun, and that's fine. Even paintball is, paintball is fun. Like I have a lot of fun, even when I'm drilling and I'm tired because it's the 150th slide I've done today, or the 150th uh, shot 
at, at the snake lane I've done today. I'm still having a good time because I'm out there playing paintball, and I love paintball. But I'm trying to train my train myself to an elite level in paintball so that one day I can go out there and say I'm a pro, you know. Um, and let's see. That was really all I had on that subject. I know we kind of rambled around a little bit there, but um, the, the important point is as a player or as a coach, um, when you're approaching the season, you're approaching an event, whatever it is you're approaching um, or aiming towards, make sure that everybody's on the same page and if, they, if their goal is to go forward and be better and, and get, continue to improve, you have to make it known like, hey, I'm going to push you. I'm going to make you uncomfortable. I'm going to push you to that uncomfortable zone where you're doing something you're not really sure if you, do, you know how to do or you're not really sure you're at that level yet. I'm going to push you to get to that level. And that's my job as a coach. That's, that's our job as, as players on a team is to motivate each other and push each other and make each other a little bit uncomfortable because when you're uncomfortable, that's when you're growing. You know, that that feeling of like, hey, I'm not sure that's when growth happens. You know, growth doesn't happen when I'm doing something I'm completely comfortable with. Right. Like completely comfortable with running to the Dorito one off the break. Right. Like I'm comfortable with that. I can do that. You know, but coach said, all right, now I want you to take a big bite. Right. I want you to find a way to get to the 50 off the break. OK. And my slow, broken old ass is not going to make the 50 off the break. But if that's the goal, I'm going to try it. I'm going to do it because the team needs me to do it. You know, um, even though I'm uncomfortable doing it or even though I, I'm not sure about it, uh, I'm going to do it because that is when growth happens. Forcing myself into that uncomfortable, unknown zone is when growth happens. And so as a coach, as an owner, uh, as a teammate, uh, as a captain, whoever, your, your responsibility to your fellow players is to push them. And you should always be pushing them um, because – I don't want to leave my buddies in the dust, you know. I don't want to be pushing myself constantly and improving and getting better and eventually get to a level where I look back and my buddy is just not there, you know. Um, because then we have to slow down as a team and we have to get that guy up to our level and then we can keep going forward. So we want to push everybody forward together. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, we just, like, we want to approach it with that overall attitude of I'm going to approach this like a pro because I want to be a pro. Um and uh, that's that for that subject. Uh, and then kind of going to close up the episode here. I've been talking for an hour and a half at my computer screen, um, but I, I, I'm excited. Uh, I love uh, talking paintball. Uh, next episode, uh, my goal is to uh, try and get our field owner on there. I want to get Mike O'Lear on there. He's an old pro from back in the day. He's an OG um, back when uh, people – people were brawlers uh and uh the big dudes ruled paintball um he's a lot of fun mike is one of my my absolute favorite people in the world um he he treated me like family from day one at his field um he literally has been there for me anytime i've asked a question anytime i've needed something uh mike has been all over it um he's a guy i really look up to and uh both in paintball and in life. Uh, and uh, he's, he's just a super fun guy to talk to. And I want you guys to meet him. So uh, I'm going to try and get him on. And then, uh, you know, over the next few weeks, I'm going to try and do at least one of these a week, maybe two, if we can get enough people on the on the game. Uh, so we're, next episode, that's going to be the goal, is get Mike on there. And then um, we'll probably try and get um, – my buddy from the Did It Hurt Paintball podcast on here, uh, he was he was nice enough to invite me on his a few days ago and had a lot of fun doing that. And that's what kind of gave me the confidence to go ahead and do this. Um, but I'd like to have him on. And then uh, um, young Stevie from the PTG Discord, he's, uh, he's the guy who runs the PTG Discord for uh, Play the Game podcast. He uh, plays for New York... I forget the name of the team. It's New York Ruckus or something like that. Um, but he plays uh, out of New York. Uh, he plays in, on a D3 team that, that just won the Sunshine State Major. Um, they're really, He's a really awesome guy, uh, super knowledgeable about paintball. Um, I'd love to have him on. Um, and, uh, you know, really anybody. Uh, I would definitely want to have some of the guys from my field on, some of the local players. 
Uh, you're going to get some of those guys on over the next uh, couple weeks, months, years. Um, but then eventually, hopefully, we can get – maybe you can convince uh, Tyler and Marcelo to get on here, um, call into the show. Um, but uh, for the first episode, I wanted to make sure is you know, is just kind of a – just a me thing, let you guys know who I am, get you – get you guys familiar with my uh thoughts on on paintball and in this particular subject um and then uh going forward trying to have a, a guest uh for each show but uh hopefully next episode we can get mike on we'll see i haven't told him yet so he's probably going to find out when he sees this or hears this um but that's kind of the goal is to uh to start bringing some guests on and and getting their opinions on paintball uh the goal is to bring on both local players or our newer generation of young guys that we have out on our field bringing them in and then uh bringing in as well some some seasoned uh paintball players who who understand the game at a, at a different level from a different era and will uh hopefully help kind of bring the two generations together and and talk about the future of paintball and, and things that are going on um thank you again to everybody who watches this listens to this uh you guys are awesome and i appreciate the hell out of you um couldn't do this without uh without the support of you guys um going forward you know the goal is to if we can get this thing rolling get some get some merch done and get some uh like shirts and hats and and some cool stuff to start giving out to uh, people that that watch the show and listen to the show um and uh also to to bring on as many paintball minds as we can have and and just kind of um talk paintball and discuss certain you know whether it's an issue in our game and how do we solve it or it's a uh, a great thing going on in our game and how do we continue that and grow that uh, but thank you guys so much for watching this first episode of snake bit podcast um snake bit you know, i mumble a little bit sorry um but thank you so much i appreciate you guys and i look forward to seeing you guys again next week on the show um Go ahead and give this a like and a thumbs up if you're on the uh, YouTube. Share the heck out of it. Uh, if you're watching it in the podcast realm, uh, please uh, share the link to whoever you know that loves paintball content and uh, uh, let me know what you think. Uh, but I'll see you guys out on the next video. This is uh, T Swifty signing off. I'll see you guys again. Mahalo. I play this game I like it's chess yeah. We next, that's a check Over stripes, yeah, yeah Look, tell me what's the vibes, what's the moves Tell me what's the vibes, what's the moves